order. It's time for questions to the Minister of Health and Services and Public Safety. And we'll start first of all with oral questions to the Minister. And I call Phil Flanagan. Mr. Flanagan. Question number one. The Western Health and Social Care Trust has advised that the review of the Community Meal Service has not yet been completed. During March, the Trust organised a number of engagement events to listen to service users' views on the current Community Meal Services and their thoughts on how it could be improved or changed. The aim of the service review, which is due to finish on May the 9th, is to secure a future model that addresses the assessed needs of those who meet the criteria for access to community meals across all Trust localities. Any future models uh, must deliver meals to the nutritional standard required over a seven-day week and provide value for money in line with departmental guidance on charging for the community meal service. I thank the Minister for his answer. I just want to, to further elaborate on the review the Minister is talking about. The proposal we're looking at is actually to take hot dinners away from elderly people and replace it with a microwaved alternative, and I don't think that that could ever constitute value for money. It's a disgraceful proposal. And I'd like the, the, the Minister to reflect on the fact that there would be uproar in here if it was brought forward for the canteen downstairs. Can the Minister give me an assurance that he won't allow such a proposal to go any further and that he will gather, guarantee the retention of fresh, hot and healthy dinners for people to choose to live at home longer in, in line with this transforming your care policy? Well, all of that would be uh, considerably easier for to, me to do if uh, we had a financial settlement and I wasn't faced with large cuts next year as a result of welfare reform. Tom Elliott. Uh, <coughs> thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, thank the Minister for that. Can the Minister give us any detail on the, on the numbers of individuals who are currently receiving uh, the Meals at Home service in County Fermanagh? Yes, I think it's uh, over 1,100. I think it's 1,160 um, people receive uh, meals uh, uh, in, in, County, in uh, the Western Trust area. Uh, so there are a considerable number of people who actually benefit um, from the Meals and Wheels service. And uh, I recognise uh, the benefit to elderly people in particular, not just for elderly people, but for vulnerable adults, but to elderly people in particular, uh, the benefits of community meals. It has been done at, at very good value for money, as things currently stand. And uh, we need to ensure that that um, continues to be the case. And, uh, some, some people may make the argument uh, that we should be charging a little more to ensure uh, the continuity of the service, and that we must remember that in all of this there has been considerable food price inflation in recent years, um, as well as considerable fuel inflation, and consequently uh, the costs uh, by the providers is, has been driven upwards. Uh, David McElveen. Mr. Thank McElveen. You. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answers so far. Um, just following on from Mr. Elliott's point, um, Minister, just to broaden that out a little bit, um, how, how many people in total in Northern Ireland are in receipt of domiciliary care um, in, a, in a general sense? Well, Health and Social Care Trust provide domiciliary care services for 25,330 pe people. Um, that's 5% more than the number during. Uh, the same survey week in uh, 2012. So there is a continu continued <laughs> increase in the numbers of people receiving domiciliary care. That fits with our policy of keeping people in their own homes and ensuring that they get the appropriate support in their own homes. Megan Fearn. Transforming your care with its focus on home as a hub of care for older people aims to help avoid unnecessary admissions of older people into hospital and encourage independence by providing home or community-based alternatives to A&E for patients who do not have acute severe illness or injury, improving collaborative working between the hospital and primary care sectors, and developing alternative routes into hospital for patients. We can help to reduce the number of older people who need to attend an emergency department. An example of measures to improve the, the care and experience of older people the Belfast Trust has piloted a successful acute care at home service headed by a consultant which can provide care at home which previ previously would have needed hospital admission. The Trust has established an acute medical assessment facility within the RVHAMU which will allow GP direct assessment and enhance the service already in existence at the Belfast City Hospital. Megaphere. I thank the Minister for his answer. Um, the College of Emergency Medicine recommended in November 2013 that actually 
what was needed was an aging infrastructure referred to as silver box, right? Emergency departments. Can I ask, has the Minister acted on this? Well, we have uh, been working closely with the College of Emergency Medicine, and indeed um, we're having a summit this week with the College um, of Emergency Medicine um, on the care and support that we provide for people uh, in the emergency departments and indeed in our uh, uh, AMUs. As a consequence of that, uh, Belf Belfast Trust has taken on four additional consultants. Um, they are currently taking on uh, 40 additional nurses, some of them are in place, and uh, m many of them will be in place shortly. But of course, um, all of these things will be made tougher if we have to face cuts next year as a result of welfare reform, and that is something which is going to have a potentially devastating impact upon the health service if that is the case. Gordon Dunn. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answers today. Does the Minister see a greater role for residential homes in providing intermediate care for, to try and reduce the pressure on our hospitals? Uh, yes, I, I thank the member for the question. Obviously, um, the issue of residential care homes is, is something that we have been looking at um, over the course of the, the last year uh, and how we make best use of them. And one of the things that I have asked the Health and Social Care Board to give consideration to is, is the ability to use residential care homes <coughs> as step-down facilities uh, to, to enable uh, what I referred to earlier on as the consultant at home uh, care model uh, to perhaps be used in those circumstances and that's something um, that I hope will be investigated over the course of the next number of months. McKinney. Mr. McKinney. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and can I thank the Minister? And can I ask him uh, why it is the two and a half years into the Transforming Your Care initiative, the Belfast Trust can only point to a pilot scheme relating to acute care at home? Well, of course, it's not just one pilot scheme. Across the Trust, uh, there's a series uh, of schemes that, that have been taken place, and the integrated care partnerships have now been established, and they will be actually be key to, to the delivery. Um, of reform within the health service uh, by bringing together all of the key players um, operating across the 17 ICPs uh, to enable that to happen. The pilot has been a successful pilot in the acute care at home, um, serviced by a, a, a lead consultant, uh, which enables uh, people to receive that kind of care in their own home uh, that they would otherwise receive in the hospital, in other words, um, be, to be getting intravenous drips, uh, to be given blood, to be given intravenous antibiotics. The Northern Trust, for example, provides a rapid response community nurse-led service um, through GP referral to address health and social care crises, offering home-based alternatives to acute hospital care, and provides a consultant geriatrician uh, to support, to, for support uh, for nursing homes, which has reduced the number of tenancies from this patient group. So there's a series of things that are going on. Um, I'm somewhat alarmed that someone who's been on the health committee for the length of time that he has uh, is only aware of that one, and, and uh, perhaps he should avail himself of, of getting more knowledge on these issues. Roy Banks. Mr. Banks. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. There, there are considerable risks with uh, elderly and vulnerable people having to wait excessive times at accident and emergency units. Uh, when will there be formal arrangements between every hospital and GPs so that those excessive waits can be bypassed and those who have been assessed by a GP can go direct to a hospital bed? Well, like many of us uh, as, uh, can remember a, a point of time whenever GPs um, did directly admit uh, most people to hospitals. And for whatever reason, over a number of years, uh, that changed. So what, what I inherited was, was a system where if a GP had a concern about someone that they were admitted to emergency departments and then the hospitals. Uh, so I, I fundamentally want to change that. And uh, we need to ensure uh, that there is a communication that exists between general practice uh, and indeed uh, our, our, our hospitals that ensures that uh, people are admitted appropriately um, and that uh, we have as many people as possible who can be admitted, admitted to hospital, uh, elderly people, without having to go through emergency departments. I indicated the work of the ICPs. Um, they will uh, be fundamental in terms of a lot of the background work uh, that is done on this, and we have arrangements in place at a number of hospital sites for direct access, including Alton Gelvin, Belfast City, Antrim, Lagan Valley, and Down Hospitals, 
uh, with plans to initiate it in, in the Royal and other sites in the, o, o, over the coming year. Mr. Story. Uh, question number three, Mr. Speaker. The advice from JCVI gives us the opportunity to plan for a managed and orderly introduction of a new Men B vaccine into the current childhood vaccination pro programme, subject to the vaccine being procured at a cost-effective price. I have always welcomed the quest for an effective, safe and cost-effective vaccine to protect against meningitis B. The negotiations regarding the vaccine price will now be taken forward by the Department of Health in England. On behalf of all the UK health departments, and I look forward to a positive outcome. Story. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. And I have no doubt that many will welcome the news by the Minister in the House today, and, and particularly those uh, who are in a, a particular need uh, in regards to uh, suffering as a result of meningitis. But can the Minister uh, further uh, outline for us what support his department uh, currently provides to tackle meningitis? Well, in terms of um, what we are doing in Northern Ireland as regards to the rest of the United Kingdom, uh, the vaccination policy is, is set by the Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation. And we have a series of vaccinations which are currently in place uh, for various uh, forms of meningitis. And there was obviously a gap in meningitis B, and, and there was considerable lobbying about this issue. So I welcome the, the, the JCVI recommendation. I hope that the negotiations on price are successful, and I hope that we in Northern Ireland are in a position uh, to adopt the new treatments that are recommended by NICE and by the other bodies uh, in the incoming year. Um, that is something which, again, um, I will be unable to do if I have money stripped away from me because of the welfare reform money uh, being taken from the Department of Health. Question number seven to the Minister has been withdrawn. Sean Rogers. Mr. Speaker, and thanks to the Minister for his answers thus far. In your recent answer, Minister, you talked about the positive outcome of the negotiation. Hopefully that will happen. When, when do you expect then that um, the new system for meningitis B will be in operation here? Well, uh, JCVI finished its conclusions on uh, the 11th and 12th of February. The recommendations were published on the 21st of March. And they recommend that there should be a carefully planned National Meningitis B Immunisation Programme for Infants using a three-dose schedule at two, four and twelve months of age. Um, they think that uh, we can do that um, in the incoming year, uh, should negotiations be successful uh, with the suppliers of the vaccination. Uh, but again, we in Northern Ireland are very, very keen to do this, but we're not sure uh, if we're going to be able to introduce new treatments if we don't have the finance available as a consequence of the cuts because of the welfare reform. David Hillage. Question four. Uh, Mr. Speaker, with your permission, I'll answer questions four and six together. I have been advised by the Nolan Trust that waiting time performance for inpatient and day casement treatment at Antrim Hospital is broadly in line with my department's targets. At the end of March 2014, less than uh, five patients were waiting over 26 weeks for inpatient or day case treatment at Antrim Area Hospital. With regard to emergency care pressures, the emergency department in Antrim Hospital has seen an increase in attendances and admissions in 2013-14 compared to the previous year, with attendances up by around 2 per cent and non-elective admissions by 5.6%. Despite this, there has been a significant improvement in performance. In 2013-14, performance against the 4-hour emergency department standard was 70.7 per cent, uh, compared to 64.5 per cent in 2012-13. In 2013-14, 884 people waited longer than 12 hours in Antrim's area hospital's emergency department, compared to 1,811 in 2012-13, a reduction of more than 50 per cent. Although Antrim Area Hospital's emergency department is not yet meeting the targets, I have set for emergency care there is clear evidence uh, that considerable progress is being made. David Hillage. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the Minister for the information he has supplied to us. Uh, what other measures are planned to improve the emergency care and the patient flows in Antrim? Well, I think it's important to recognise that whilst progress is being made, uh, we, we can't uh, 
uh, continue to sit on laurels and, and, and need to keep moving things on. So we have looked at what further measures could be taken to improve emergency care and patient flows at the hospital, including the relocation of a mental health, health crisis response team from Hollywell to Antrim site uh, to more quickly expedite referrals and assessments and provide a more responsive service uh, for those people with mental health needs. Uh, we're also looking at the relocation of the older people's psychiatric team to the Antrim site from Hollywell, the development of a paediatric ambulatory area on the Antrim site, expansion of the GP assessment unit uh, to include surgical referrals, further expansion of seven-day working, and the consolidation of additional evening and weekend ward rounds. Danny Kinahan. Mr. Thank you much, Mr. Speaker. May I thank the Minister for his um, answer. Um, we all know we've got excellent um, and incredibly skilled and hardworking staff throughout the health service. But in Antrim Hospital, would he accept that the level of staff morale is at an all-time low? And that with the new introduction of car parking charges in Antrim, where you have a difficulty with local public transport and none for shift workers, that this is going to put even more pressure on morale? And can he answer the question without referring to the welfare fund? Uh, well, I, I very much welcome, welcome the question uh, because the member hasn't written anything like this to me. So if he was uh, aware of staff morale being low, I'm surprised that he's kept it to himself until today. Dr. Alistair MacDonald. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And could I ask the Minister, does he agree with me that, that ba basically the pressures at the Royal Victoria Hospital are having a knock-on effect right down into Antrim? And does he agree with me further that some investment in primary care would siphon off a considerable amount of this because primary care gets less than 4% of the NHS budget and yet handles 90% of the contacts? And are there any plans in place to fund some sort of a project in that direction, pilot or otherwise, that might allow a, a realignment or a redirecting of a lot of the demand that's going into A&E into primary care. Well, of course, transforming your care is all about how we best use primary care, how we support primary care, and indeed uh, it identified that there should be a 5% shift in, in funding, uh, overall funding, um, from, from uh, the hospital care uh, to primary care. I should say that uh, it is not 4% that, that uh, primary care takes. I, I think it is at least double that, so we need to get our, our facts right on that, that, that issue. Uh, but that primary care is a key element of ensuring that people's needs are met uh, without attending hospitals. Hospitals should not be the first port of call uh, for many, many people um, who need to receive medical care. Cahill Boylan. Mr Boylan. Just ever occurred, let a hold question number five, please. The main way of assessing acute hospital services are through a GP or a GP out of hours referral, through an emergency department or admission through an outpatient clinic. Dentists and opticians may refer patients to consultant-led dental services and ophthalmology services. Health and social care trusts have individual local arrangements for direct access to certain acute services by patients or through health care professional referral. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank the Minister for his answer. But does the Minister agree that GP out hour service should be located at hospitals? Well, it certainly is an option, and I think that it is a preferable option in many circumstances to have a GP service available on the side of the hospital. So those people who shouldn't be in emergency departments can be very quickly referred elsewhere. Uh, sometimes people uh, come to hospital because they have a difficulty um, getting a, an appointment with a GP. Sometimes people come to hospital and use that as an excuse. Um, so we need to ensure uh, that we can eliminate um, those, those kinds of practices and ensure that people who need to see a GP have the opportunity of seeing a GP um, as opposed to uh, going through an, an emergency department. Uh, Jim Wells. Yes, uh, well. Could the Minister outline what progress has been made on self-referral for physiotherapy? Yeah, self-referral uh, physiotherapy is, is important and I uh, had the opportunity of, of, of speaking at events last week uh, relating to allied health professionals who provide a, a wonderful service and I, I know the member attended a number of those events, uh, one in his own uh, constituency, but 
Transforming Your Care promotes the local availability of services and is looking to provide uh, the services closer to home. And, and directly arising out of that, the Public Health Agency is leading on self-referral physi physiotherapy on behalf of the health and social care. And self-referral is a system of access that allows the patient to refer themselves to a physiotherapist directly without having to see or be referred by another health care practitioner. The South Eastern Trust has been piloting an exercise on direct referral. It is intended that all trusts will be in a position to offer patients the opportunity for self-referral for physiotherapy by the end of March 2015. Most self-referrals will relate to the musculoskeletal care pathway, but other care pathways may be included, subject to the evaluation of the pilot in the South Eastern Trust. Leslie Creed. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, with the excessive waiting times uh, to see a GP and little confidence in the out-of-hours GP service, patients frequently have no option other than to turn up at A&E to seek help. How have the recent closures and restrictions of opening hours of accident and emergency departments at Lagan Valley and Down hospitals further advers adversely affected the ability of patients to access acute services in hospitals such as the Ulster? Well, in terms of um, what, what the member says uh, in little confidence in uh, out of our services, I, I would have to disagree with the member on that and disagree with the member on, on the basis of uh, the most recent research that has carried out on, on the state of the health service, and I think it was over 90 per cent were satisfied with the, with the out of our service. So, uh, 90 per cent isn't, is, is, isn't, isn't bad uh, in that respect and doesn't demonstrate huge dissatisfaction. Uh, on the other element of the question, I, I think that uh, it cannot help uh, any um, facility that is under pressure, and we recognise that the Ulster and Royal and other hospitals are under pressure, uh, to have more pressure applied to them, and that's why I, I fundamentally disagreed with the further reduction uh, in the hours. Uh, at the Lagan Valley and indeed at the Down Hospital. And uh, I'm keen to see uh, us ensuring that there is 24 7 access to both those facilities uh, in the foreseeable future, uh, that we make better use um, of GP direct admissions, uh, that we make better use of uh, the specialist nurses uh, to deal with a lot of the minor injuries, and ensure that the emergency departments at our, at our major um, hospitals are that emergency departments to deal with emergency situations. Karen McEvitt. Mr Speaker, um, just to touch uh, base back with the assessment cent uh, with the walk in centres, can I ask the Minister what's his assessment on walk in centres and their viability, uh, the potential viability in Northern Ireland? Well <clears throat> in, in all of this sometimes when you make things available in the health service uh, people will, will use them uh, to a greater extent than is required. Uh, so that's something that we have to be careful about. And previously, uh, we had um, pharmacists who, who were, were carrying out work, and it just appeared to increase the workload as opposed to, to dealing with things. And that had to be changed because they were ending up dealing with common colds and so forth, uh, which wasn't really what, uh, which wasn't really uh, what the whole thing was meant to be about. So we need to ensure that, uh, in terms of all of these facilities and these centres. Uh, that people are using them appropriately and that we are demonstrating um, real benefit from, from them. Um, we do uh, recognise that the reviews across the water has been mixed thus far and uh, that they haven't actually um, improved care, so that's, that's something that, that, that we need to uh, take cognizance of. Mr Morrow. Question number eight, Mr Speaker. Thank you. One of the key elements <coughs> in the implementation of our health care transformation programme is the promotion of innovation to improve services and develop solutions that meet the needs of our patients and the HSC and ultimately help improve health outcomes. However, it is recognised that the public sector procurement methods have made it difficult for the industry to engage in a meaningful way with the health and social care sector. This is where SBRI programme has the potential to make a big impact by lowering the barriers for business, seeking to access the health and social care market, providing opportunities for innovative companies to engage with the public sector at an early de de developmental stage, and to deliver solutions which better address public sector needs at lower costs. For health and social care, 
SBRI brings the potential for clinicians and managers to engage with the technology industry to develop and test innovative solutions to meet the needs of their patients. On the 3rd of March, together with my colleague, the Industry Minister Arlene Foster, I announced the launch of Small Business Research Initiative competition to develop technology solutions to help improve medical adherence. This is the first health-related SBRI competition in Northern Ireland. It represents a real opportunity to develop technology solutions that will improve medicine's adherence by supporting people to take the right medicines at the right time as prescribed. I am confident that the opportunities for such competitions will be identified in the coming months, supported by the forthcoming appointment of an SBRI executive to the HSC. Lord Morrow. Uh, well, I thank the Minister for his very full and comprehensive uh, response to my question. Could I ask the Minister, what is the annual spend on medicines in Northern Ireland? Expenditure on medicines in Northern Ireland accounts for some £540 million pounds of the annual budget of health and social care, equating to around 12 per cent of the total budget. In 2012, over £37 million prescriptions were dispensed in primary care alone at a cost of over £400 million. Pounds. Expenditure in medicines is increasing at around 5 per cent every year. An average of 19.9 prescription items is issued per person per year in Northern Ireland, comparing to 17.7 in England, 17.6 in Scotland. Average annual costs per person are also higher in Northern Ireland at £19.90, compared to £17.70 in England and £17.60 in Scotland. In the United Kingdom as a whole, the cost of hospital admissions resulting from people not taking medicines as recommended were estimated at between 36 and 196 million in 2006-07. Joe Bird, Mr. Bird. Mr. Speaker, I thank the Minister for his answers. Could the Minister outline what is the extent of bioscience medical research going on in Northern Ireland and what public monies are being used to fund it, particularly in relation to cancer treatments? Well, I think that's one of the really good news stories and, and it seldom gets much attention. So, for example, we have a thousand people who are based in research in the city hospital um, as an arm of Queen's University Belfast. Uh, we have recently opened uh, new facilities there, which uh, has allowed us to introduce even more expertise. And under Patrick, Professor Paddy Johnson's uh, work, we have brought some of the top scientists in cancer research to Northern Ireland. And uh, I was delighted whenever he was appointed Vice Chancellor of, of Queen's University Belfast, because I think that's a relationship which can deliver much more. So there is a massive amount of work going on in terms of cancer research. And consequently, it is somewhere in the region of 1,200 people who are benefiting from the most advanced cancer drugs, which many of them are, are, are not on the market yet, but are about to come onto the market, and they're benefiting from that because we are carrying out um, advanced research uh, into cancer. Chris Little. Mr. Little. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question number nine. Mr. Speaker, with your permission, I'll answer questions number nine and twelve together. This is both about the same subject. The Public Health Agency expects to finalise the preparation of the awareness campaign by September or October. <clears throat> with the commencement of the campaign shortly thereafter. In addition, and to move things forward more swiftly, to improve awareness of ovarian cancer, the PHA plans to initiate an awareness raising program over the coming weeks. The program will comprise the targeted distribution of leaflets and posters, possibly supplemented by a platform piece to be included in local newspaper publications. And whenever possible, I take the opportunity to raise a profile of the illness. On the 3rd of March, I addressed the Ovarian Cancer Awareness Seminar held in Parliament buildings. On the 26th of March, I visited the Angels of Hope drop-in centre, where I had the opportunity to speak to doctors, nurses, and other health care staff who care for patients diagnosed with ovarian cancer, as well as to the bereaved relatives of those who have lost their lives to the disease. And I'd like to take the opportunity to thank the ovarian cancer charities for the excellent work they did during March to highlight the signs and symptoms of ovarian cancer. Order members, that includes all questions. Uh, to the Minister of Health. We now move on to topical questions uh, to the Minister. And it's Ian Millen. Mr. 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 Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, 
As the Minister would know, alcohol misuse costs uh, approximately £900 million per year, and £250 million of that is borne by health and social care. What is the Minister doing to tackle this? Well, certainly on, on those issues, I've had uh, regular uh, conversations with fellow Ministers, uh, including uh, Minister Riley uh, in the Republic of Ireland, and also colleagues in Scotland and Wales. And, uh, we have, carried out a, a, or have commissioned a course of work to be carried out by Sheffield University um, on the impact of, of a minimum price for alcohol, and that's something that we look forward to, to moving on uh, whenever we have that qualitative piece of research. We've been observing very closely what Scotland has been doing because it has moved ahead uh, with the proposal for a minimum price for, for alcohol, and uh, that is a, 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 an area that has been challenged by the courts, and, and we will observe that very, very closely. Uh, so all, all of the, the ministers that I have mentioned are very supportive of going that particular direction. We also uh, launched a new strategic direction for drugs and alcohol um, last year, and uh, that is something which is providing considerable support um, to the trusts and others um, as they carry out work in the community. And we have supported <coughs> a number of organisations which are out there um, providing education um, about the use of alcohol, about the proper use of alcohol and about the abuse of alcohol and the damage that it can cause. Ian Miller. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer thus far. Uh, can I ask the Minister uh, can, can, can the Minister commit to developing an all-island an all island strategy to tackle addiction and substance abuse? Uh, I'm, I'm always delighted to develop all-island strategies uh, whenever it relates to this, and that's why I have been engaging uh, with colleagues in the Republic of Ireland, Scotland, England and Wales, because I don't see uh, the benefit of Northern Ireland going it alone. Uh, I don't see the benefit of uh, the Republic of Ireland going it alone, or indeed Scotland going it alone. I think that if we can do it across these British Isles, that that will make a real transformational difference. And uh, that's why I'm encouraging other ministers uh, to move ahead on this, and that we will not be found wanting um, on this particular issue, that being the case. Uh, Jerry Kelly. Mr. Kelly. Kelly. The minister will be aware that I think it's in 2011 there was Westminster legislation brought in to allow for uh, blood donations from all uh, sections and individuals, including gay men. In fact, it was brought on uh, to prevent the uh, discrimination against gay men. Uh, bearing in mind that we uh, in the North get blood donation from uh, England, Scotland and Wales, could the Minister explain why he is pursuing uh, in the courts uh, trying to prevent uh, gay men uh, donating blood? Well, of course, uh, nobody uh, mentioned anything about gay men. It's, it's about people who engage in higher risk behaviours um, that the discussion is about. And uh, therefore, it's regarded as MSM, that's men who have sex with men. And uh, on this particular issue, uh, I'm somewhat confused at Sinn Féin today because the previous person who asked a question wanted to identify an All Ireland approach. And now, this uh, Mr. Kelly, he wants to follow the British approach because the Republic of Ireland don't actually allow uh, for, for, for blood to be coming from MSM men. And uh, Mr. Riley has corresponded with me indicating that he has no intention of introducing that. So Mr. Kelly wants to have the British route as opposed to Mr. Milne who wants the All Ireland route. Which is it? Mr. Kelly. I thank the Minister for his uh, answer or lack of answer up to now. He actually avoided the question. And in terms of uh, the issue, we will be pursuing uh, this issue of equality uh, throughout Ireland. Uh, in this case, and you know, to throw it back at himself, he's the one who got up and said he doesn't want the North to uh, act on its own and he wants others to act along with him. Now you are uh, saying that we shouldn't follow the example of ending discrimination against those who does the minister, and could he answer this question, uh, does he believe in equality for all, including gay men? I think uh, the member knows very well that this is a matter that is currently being uh, looked at by the courts. And I think that uh, we should leave. I think, uh, Mr. Speaker, that I need to be very careful and leave it to the fairness and impartiality of the courts uh, to come back with their advice on it. Thank you. Trevor Clark. Mr. Clark. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, can the Minister outline, uh, sorry, outline when he again hopes to meet Dr. Mayer in terms of the paediatric cardiac surgery? 
I am delighted to indicate that Dr. Amir is in the country um, for all of this week, along with the other two experts. And they have an extensive program of work that they're engaging in um, over the course of this week, um, a series of meetings, uh, and it'll be a, a very, very busy program. I greatly appreciate the fact that we have someone of his expertise who is giving it, us advice on this issue. Uh, Dr. Amir oversees over a thousand uh, surgical procedures each year. Uh, he doesn't carry them all out in the one hospital. And there's other hospitals in Massachusetts, um, and indeed in Boston, where he uh, provides those services and ensures those services are provided under his guidance. And uh, if anybody can actually identify a way forward in this, I, I would have a lot of confidence that, 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 that he has the ability to do, to do that. And if his recommendation is something that is not to our liking, um, then I think that we do have to give great cognizance to that as well. Trevor Clark. Thank you, much, Speaker. Um, I thank the Minister for his answer. The Minister will be aware in terms of paediatric surgery, one of the main concerns for the parents, or one of the concerns would be actually currently the transport arrangements. Have you, is there any plans in terms of what, what the position is currently uh, or discussions that you are actually having with your officials in terms of the transport arrangements? Well, uh, of course, that is a matter of great importance, irrespective of whether we have uh, a facility um, based in Dublin or a facility that is based in Belfast, um, which uses Dublin. Uh, and indeed other centres in the United Kingdom uh, to, to support uh, children who require uh, very complex uh, congenital cardiac surgery. We have acquired an ambulance uh, at the cost of £190,000, £120,000 for the ambulance, £70,000 for the intensive care cot which goes inside the ambulance. Uh, it has four seats in the back of the ambulance to facilitate uh, intensive care services being provided uh, in the ambulance, so we can have key personnel from the nursing side uh, and from uh, the clinical side um, and the family member all, all in the ambulance and ensure that the, 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 the child can receive the support and care that it needs uh, whilst not being in a hospital uh, and uh, its care will be in no way diminished uh, in the transportation. Uh, we're looking at acquiring a second ambulance um, to ensure that that service is available uh, as well. Alec Baskin. Mr. Maskey. Can I uh, ask the Minister that, to respond? Uh, the Royal College of Nursing and Evidence recently to a health committee stated that uh, there is a systemic blockage in the system which prevents frontline staff from being heard. Would the Minister agree if that is the case that that would surely be an indictment of the Department? Well, certainly in, in all of these things, uh, I have sought to encourage openness and transparency, and that's why. I uh, wrote to every member of staff encouraging them uh, to come forward if they have issues of concern. Um, in fact, not just in encouraging them, indicating them, indicating to them that it was their responsibility if they saw something that uh, wasn't right, uh, that they pursued that matter, that they followed it up, and they took it uh, to a higher level if they weren't getting the response uh, that they should have uh, from the first uh, numbers of people. Uh, so that's something that, that I will continue to drive. Alec Matsky. Can I thank the Minister for that response? And I think that's obviously bound to be a very constructive response from the Minister, and uh, hopefully that will uh, trickle through to all the members of the staff. In the same evidence session, the Royal College actually indicated that a number of nurses, in, the, in their words, are working beyond or, or above their capacity. Would the Minister uh, occurred a comment that that would, in fact, mean a, a risk to uh, patients? Well, in terms of nurses, it's, it's important that we have appropriate treat, training um, to ensure that we have appropriate treatment. And uh, I have been uh, in regular contact with the chief nursing officer uh, and have been encouraging uh, her to, to actually develop more opportunities uh, for specialist training and emergency nurse practitioners and indeed advanced emergency nurse practitioners. And uh, these are routes that we are going down, which will ensure that uh, nursing can actually carry out even further responsibilities uh, and reduce uh, pressures on the clinical side, and it's a much faster response time that we can actually uh, deliver on this uh, because we have a, a, a good availability of nursing staff, and uh, obviously the opportunity to further upskill uh, is something that many nurses will want to avail of. Dahi Mackay, Mr. Mackay. Sure, the minister will be aware of a young couple from my constituency. Uh, he lost their baby daughter, Erin McCauley, uh, after a serious adverse incident. 
uh, at Causeway Hospital in 2008. Now, the Trust had their own report showing they were to blame for this incident in 2009. Uh, so can I ask the Minister why the family had to bring this case to court last year in 2013 uh, for the Trust to finally accept liability uh, and why he did not intervene uh, to prevent the cover-up in this case and in other cases uh, from continuing under his watch? Well, uh, certainly I wasn't aware of the case until um, the, the current directors of the Northern Trust that I put in place, that I put in place uh, because I inherited uh, the issues in the Northern Trust. And it's those directors who brought it to my attention that there was uh, a, a number of cases, uh, and, uh, including the Macaulay case and indeed others. And I think that we need to be very clear that um, where hospitals fail, they need to be open and transparent about those failures and uh, work with families in terms of telling them what has happened and uh, ensuring uh, that we can move forward. I intend to update uh, the Assembly tomorrow um, with a statement on these issues, and I think that members will see uh, the, the level of commitment that we are wanting uh, to provide to ensure that we have the safest possible uh, health care system anywhere in the world. Can I say, in this case, the family have received the Weir report that was carried out by the Trust in terms of their daughter's case, but the Trust has not released all relevant reports in this case to the family. Today, they still haven't received all the information that they're entitled to. Can I ask the Minister, will he now give a clear commitment that they receive all information in this file that they are entitled to? Well, in all of this, the member is asking me questions which um, I wouldn't have been made aware of in terms of um, this family. Um, they hadn't been in contact with me directly at this stage. Uh, another family has requested a meeting with myself, and, and I will be happy to fulfil that. Um, however, in all of this, what we always need to remember is that something went wrong, and the consequence of that something going wrong uh, was that uh, somebody lost their life, and in this instance, um, it was a, a little child, a little baby, and therefore the pain that that, that family is suffering uh, is something that we need to recognise in the first instance, and we need to help to reduce and, and mitigate that pain by, by, by uh, ensuring that, that they do not have to go through uh, long processes to identify what happened and to find the truth. And whenever I look at what happened in terms of hyponatremia, which started around 17 years ago, and I see the pain that those families have went through. I don't want a health and social care service that delivers like that. I want a health and social care service which can actually identify if it has made a mistake, uh, that we be upfront about it with families at, at, at an early point and ensure that families don't have to go through additional trauma because they've suffered enough. Mr. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, it's early April, but has the Minister had an opportunity yet to review the emergency department of the Causeway Hospital's performance over the winter period? Well, in the Causeway Emergency Department, um, over the past six months, um, 12 hour waits have been virtually eliminated. Around three quarters of patients are seen within four hours. Um, Causeway hasn't seen the same increase in emergency department pressures as Antrim has, although it tends to experience more pressure over the, the spring and the summer months as a result of the visitors uh, coming to North Coast during this time. And the member always reminds me of this whenever people talk about the Causeway Hospital, about the influx. And uh, members will be aware from my recent update and implementation of the improvement plan at the Northern Trust that operational plans for both Antrim and Causeway Hospitals identified new ways of working to improve performance, particularly in unscheduled care, and uh, that course of work was completed in June. Mr. Campbell. Can the Minister give an assessment of progress that, that has been made uh, by the turnaround team uh, in the Northern Trust overall? Overall, we, think we have seen a, a tremendous improvement um, in the Northern Trust. We have seen an improvement in terms of waiting times uh, for elective uh, current procedure. We have seen massive improvement in the emergency departments. And uh, we're now seeing uh, the culture changing, which was a culture of not telling people what was going on, to a culture of openness and transparency. It was the senior directors, and we need to recognise this, that came forward and said we have uh, identified um, uh, th these cases of serious adverse incidents. 
which were not previously uh, made public, and they have made that public. And as a consequence, we have heard the very sad stories um, of individuals and, and, and what has happened and what went wrong and what shouldn't have happened. And uh, I would have to say that we have seen a, a massive improvement in the Northern Trust area um, over the course of the last year. Members, any questions on the Minister of Health?